it's it's really good to have you here. I'm glad that, I'm glad the plane touched down safely. Thanks. Uh, can you tell us a little about yourself? Uh, yeah. So uh, I've got a family, one wife, three kids, 18, 16, and 13. Uh, the eldest just finishing school, which is a scary thing. Um, I have a couple of different uh, roles in my life, which just to keep things interesting. One is I um, I help lead the, the ministry called EMU Music, and EMU is a complicated beast in itself, but primarily we're about creating new songs and publishing and distributing new songs for, for congregations to sing with a particular evangelical Christ focus. Um, the other thing we do with EMU is uh, training church musicians and uh, we do that through our conferences here. So Twist is on this weekend. Yeah, here Twist is on Sydney. on tomorrow. Twist stands for the word in songs together. It's a kind of an acronym summarising Colossians three sixteen. But I'm also I also understand Amy you're doing other you know, they've got other platforms and other training platforms as well, is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we're becoming more and more global with that. So in Singapore over the last couple of days we've been doing master classes and uh, what uh, it's basically an evangelistic concert, music, music and gospel presentations. So uh, we're, we're, we're really just about promoting uh, the gospel in Chicago. Right, and uh, and Sinebs, how did you how did you get yourself into Sinebs? Yeah, by accident really. Um, I was basically just uh, visiting the UK, training uh, a whole range of churches that had some kind of contact with, with EMU. Uh, through our songs, last place I ended up was Synabs in Oxford, and uh, they basically said, "Sorry, things are such a mess here. We don't have anyone running our music at the moment." And I just had this crazy thought, "Oh, maybe I could come over for you, help them out." And uh, surprisingly, they said yes to that idea. And yeah, I'm still there nine years later. Yeah, I I've, I've just come back from the UK, so you know, I know, you know, literally two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I've got two minutes experience on the UK, but one of the things I did see over there was uh, many churches had music directors. There seemed to be, you know, they were the larger larger churches, of course. Yeah. There seemed to be a place for the music, you know, the music minister or the music director. Yeah, but you're right. You're only really going to find those people in the larger churches, but I guess in the UK uh, there are a number of larger kind of flagship evangelical churches that have been... Um, established long ago and um, have been thinking that that music and, and their, their worship or whatever is being a significant part of their ministry and they need someone to, to look after it. Music director is not just like an organist choir master, so in our church yeah. we, we do have an organ but we don't use it that much. We're, okay. ba we're basically contemporary. In our music. And you don't have any choirs. You're not. Uh, you we know. have a Christmas choir, but not. <laughs> okay. not but, but no robes. And so your role at St Ebbs then, uh, leading the music there, ministry there. What, what does that involve to day to day? Yeah, we have a number of congregations, um, and I kind of responsible for four of those in terms of uh, running the people in four different music teams and working with the. Four different pastors of those congregations as we uh, plan and implement services every week. Mm -hmm. um, might talk about it later, but we kind of see it as to to make music work well and to make our whole services work well. Um, it's very much a partnership between the the preacher, the congregation leader, and the and the music leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, that'd be good to be good to hear more about the structures and systems you have, you've thought about. Uh, and having place there, but I really want to press in the start into your experience uh, being involved, you know, in church plans. Yeah. Uh, now, now Dubbo and Dremoyne are very, very different places. Yeah. Uh, can you, I guess, tell us a little bit about Dubbo and then tell us a little bit about Dremoyne and then maybe reflect on some of the big differences between the two places? Yeah. So Dubbo obviously is in rural New South Wales. Um, when Bryson Smith went out there, and we followed fairly. Closely after him, I um, wouldn't say that he was going there thinking he was doing a church plan. He was going there to be a rural pastor, but in effect, he was uh, rebooting that church. When we arrived um, shortly after Bryson, 
uh, they just moved out of an old kind of weatherboard shack because they couldn't fit into it and um, they were basically meeting in a care home and uh, the music on a good day was a guitar and a flute and on a bad day was a old lady playing an old organ with two fingers mm -hmm. and I was recently married and my wife said listen you're not getting involved with the music um, like for, for at least a year and um, didn't quite work out yeah, right there. How long did that, long that, did that last? <laughs> Got to about Easter when there was absolutely no one at all that could play anything. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll fill in for the day. Um, at this stage, you're working as a as a teacher. As well. Yeah, high school music high school, teacher, high school so music teacher. Double double Presbyterian and not employing a music director. No, no, I was just the one pastor. Yep. Um. Uh, um I guess though it's hard to hide uh, that you do music when you're a music teacher. Yeah. So I, I played the music for them for Easter and then had this strange experience afterwards where the, the eldership of the church came up to me afterwards and said, Philip, we've been praying for you to arrive. <laughs> and then it kind of went from there. Yeah, I think one of the things that every church planning core team needs to have is, is someone who um, you know, someone who can play music or mm. at least can think in the, into music um, in, a, in a big way. Uh, you know, you obviously can play the piano and a, a number of instruments pretty well. Yeah, I play a lot of things, um, but piano is my main thing because it's useful and you don't have to practice a lot. Yep. So how did you how did you develop that music ministry? You were at Dubbo for how many years? Uh, six years. Six years. So over six years, you went from uh, yeah, went from yourself probably playing lots to a team. Yeah, we had a um, regular team after a couple of years but we throughout that uh, we were not only trying to build up people into the team we were dealing with different circumstances of building so um, I said we were firstly meeting in a care home that didn't that lasted for about a year then we were into a uh, high school hall which then brought all the issues with having to pack up and sit down every yeah. week and basically all your music and every other bit of gear of the church leaving in a trailer yeah. For the other six days of the week, so um, having time to do quality music practices wasn't really the the, the thing. It was, yeah. hey, how can we get this set up in time in time for the service starting at ten o'clock? Yeah. So did that mean music practices during the week, uh, or did it just mean sound quality wasn't going to be exceptional left to it? It just <laughs> meant that you you had to work with what whatever there was there. Yeah. So, um, it's great if you can do music practices during the week, but I actually think you you always need sound check time before a service if you want it to sound good on the day. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, what about in in terms of the music culture? So it was a reboot. Um, you know, I presume you were used to singing uh, a number of hymns, and then probably used to finishing the service with the young men. You know, said a, a few times at Double Presbyterian. Uh, no, I think the dealing with a sort of I think the, the great change. I think the great blessing there was they had removed the threefold amen just before I got there, so <laughs> I, I never had to live with that. Although later when I got to Dremoyne, they were still they still love doing that. Yep. Um, uh, culture, uh, yeah, there was definitely a, a transition period where you had people who had been there for a hundred years. Uh, liking the way that things have been done in the past compared with uh, what, are, what are these new songs and and what's wrong with the, the, the lady playing the two-fingered organ kind of thing. Yeah, she's, she's doing a great job. She's a lovely yeah. member. So, so tell us about Des Moines then. You know, what, what were the big differences between you know coming uh, from, from Dubbo and then moving to Des Moines? So Des Moines, the past there was Craig Tucker um, and everything about Des Moines was that it was deliberate in terms of being a church plant. Now uh, again it was kind of a reboot of a church but it was Craig's vision was to plant a new congregation into a, an existing parish mm. which is what we were involved with and he was deliberate and thoughtful about many aspects of that so we were from memory meeting for about almost 12 months before we kicked off that congregation so we were actually thinking through everything that we wanted there to be in a church service and where music was going to function in that and uh, in a, the inner west of Sydney is uh, far more 
highly resourced uh, area than rural New South Wales. Mm -hmm. In Dubbo, um, uh, you don't have lots of people that have learnt musical instruments. You, uh, you may have your teachers and your and your medical people who are coming in to do their two years out in the country, uh, which is great to have that, but you're not necessarily having a um, like long-term highly gifted people that you can rely on. Mm. Uh, Dremoyne was a little bit different to that, so um, talented people there from day one, mm. and it uh, yeah, it felt like on day one of Dremoyne that we were uh, putting on a like a, a quality show, if I can use those terms. Yep, and so and so that was a lot more important in Dremoyne as opposed to to Dubbo in terms of just people's expectations of, of what church would look like. Um, also the, the core, you know, the core team expectations. Uh, mm -hmm. So you said you were meeting up for a whole year before you actually, you know, launched publicly. Yeah. Um, you know, with a core, but there were is obviously a lot of time spent thinking about the music, uh, how you do it. Um, yeah, and even uh, thinking through logistics, like what equipment do we need? Um, can we get it bought before we we start? What PA system we got to work with? Are we going to have keyboards, guitars, amps, and stuff? Yeah. At Dubbo, we said, I, when I arrived, it felt like we were starting from nowhere, so had no resources whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There was a, a a speaker and an amp, but. Um, what works for someone to preach through doesn't necessarily work for a band to play through. Yep. So, um, just having to deal with how how do you grow this when you've actually got no kind of uh, equipment to to do it with? I guess one of my in that, in the Dubbo context when you, when you're the the go-to person, how do you how do you keep refreshed yourself? Um, you know, you're pouring yourself out uh, each week. How how do you actually continue to I guess have joy, you know, joy in leading people in in, in music and uh, and in worshiping God. Uh, how do you have joy in you know just getting up, you know, week after week and saying, hey, let's let's praise God. Yeah, well, I just wonder whether it's a personality thing with me. So um, I probably wouldn't work in many churches, but I actually love things that happen in the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you don't have much time to get things organized and you're um, running on the edge, that actually suits me fine. And it actually still even works really well in the, the situation that I'm in now. So uh, solving problems quickly, um, I love that. Other people, however, I know completely stresses them out. Yeah. Um, and uh, not bigging myself up, up, but I don't need to think about playing the piano. I can walk in and whatever song we're going to sing, I can play it. That's not so um, straightforward for most people that you have playing music in churches. Yeah. Um, they may be competent musicians, but there'll often be a stress that goes along with having to play in church. Um, just having to uh, lead other people, playing in front of other people is is not an easy thing. Mm. I, I mean, anyone that stands up in front of a group of people will know that kind of stress. Mm. And uh, musicians, if they've like been learning the piano through the grade system, uh, they kind of have it built into their psyche that the mistakes are, are bad and 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 people will be listening out for anything that they do wrong. And I actually spent a lot of my time saying to church musicians, um, you just got to forget that people are not listening out for your mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually love the fact that you're up there leading them, and they just uh, want you to show yourself, and they want you to to lead them. Mm. That, that, that's really important. Um, you know, to you know, important to think about. I guess the culture you have amongst your bands and the culture mm -hmm. that uh, you're trying to bring. One one of the quick the key questions. You know, a lot a lot of planners are going to be you know potentially listening into this, thinking, okay, I just want the the two or three things I need to do. You know, what's the equipment I need to purchase? Yeah. Um, you know, do I have a four band setup or a three band setup? Um, you know, what what are the the three key instruments that I definitely need to have? I'll be thinking out for those things, but really, I think the key question that a, a church planner wants to be thinking about in the context of, um, you know, music in their church is, is how do you build a, a singing culture in church gatherings? How do we, you know, how do you build a culture, you know, where people walk in, they can see this, you know, this crowd of people, you know, love Jesus and yeah. uh, and wants to, you know, show that in, uh, in, in singing. Yeah, and that's kind of a huge question. Uh, 
um, and I and I think it starts spiritually. So uh, there's not a lot of um, passages in the Bible that kind of uh, nail down uh, a theology of singing, but there's a couple of passages: Colossians 3:16, Ephesians 5, and Ephesians 5 uh, makes it clear that a mark of the spirit-filled Christian is one that sings psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs mm. to one another. So I think uh, before you even wheel in your piano and get people up leading singing, uh, the Holy Spirit has to be at work in that in that church in order for people to even have the motivation to sing. Singing um, is a is a is a kind of a countercultural thing. We don't do it often in society. So church singing is is weird in many ways. Mm. Um, and I don't, and I think unless you have the, the Holy Spirit at work within the congregation, it's it's always going to feel weird. However, um, any any of any of us that have actually experienced wonderful Christian singing uh, knows that it's um, uh, it's a marvelous experience where the Holy Spirit and the and the Word of Christ is a, is at work in God's people. Mm -hmm. So, firstly, it's a spiritual thing, yeah. um, and I'm guessing. Uh, the music itself can never make that happen on its own. However, there there are there are practical things that you can do that are going to foster and encourage a great culture of singing. And if you're in the kind of situation where you are, uh, you do have the opportunity to plan how things are. Going to are going to go from day one, then I would hugely encourage to think how do we get singing as part of the DNA mm. of our church from the first day that we start. It's, I think it's a harder job to to, to let it evolve. Um, often the things that you do on day one, whether they're deliberate or undeliberate, become habits in the way that you so do we church. Start, we just start singing three songs yeah. you know, in a row and that's, that's what we do. We start yeah. with two and we finish with two. Yeah. And you just keep doing it without thinking through the why. Of yeah. But even more than that, I think um, there's deeper issues of how are we letting the word of Christ engage the heart. Mm. Um, uh, if you want that to be part of the culture of your church, which I hope you do, then you have to be thinking deliberately about how that's going to to happen. And what does that conversation look like in you know in the midst of a core team? Obviously, by the time you came to Dromoy, you you were you know more more, you know, more robust theology of music. You were obviously, hopefully, you know, cult cultivated and encouraged by Bryson. I, I imagine to, yeah. to read books, to think into, you know, to think in a whole bunch of aspects. By the time you get to Dromoyne, sort of six years in, you, you're deliberate, you know, and uh, how, you know how important is the pastor or the planter in, in that process? You know, how important is is it, you know, is it the, the person seeking to lead the music to be, you know, well thought out in, in this aspect? Great music will all, will only I think ever happen when it's uh, uh, um, kind of a, a partnership of leadership between the pastor and the music guy. Yeah. It will never work if it's one or the other. Yeah. Like when the music in a church is just given over to the music guys, um, you have no uh, theological. Um, controls over it. Chances are you'll just go what is with it. You'll just go with whatever is cool, whatever is the latest song on on YouTube, and you'll be kind of chasing after what you see out there on social media, etc. The the pastor and the music leader team, I think, ensures uh, theological uh, control, astuteness, accuracy, but uh, also allows the music to be relevant. To the the church that you that you're leading, um, appropriate to the, the congregation that you have. Mm. Uh, there's no one kind of music that works for every church and every kind of congregation. Mm. Some congregations are, are talented within themselves, and others need to be taught how to sing. So, um, uh, yeah, my my ideal situation is that the pastor and the music leader are are, are working together on that. It doesn't really work when it's one or the other mm. doing their own thing. Now, it'd be great. It'd be really helpful to hear your uh, reflections, just just in terms of 
I, I guess I see, uh, you know, in you know, we're in Sydney. We've got, you know, the the largest, you know, music, uh, you know, worship music production house in the in the world. Uh, you know, I, I heard last you know, the other day that the Hillsong brand was, um, you know, one of the most globally recognised brands in yeah. Australia. Yeah. Mm. Um, they they do music. You know, really well. Mm. Um, you know, often you know, I won't get into the debates <laughs> about theology, and, but 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 the expectation that you know they bring to you know to music production and mm. quality is, is pretty high. Um, what would you say to a, a church planner who's you know sort of thinking <laughs> thinking like, do I need do I need to be that good? You know, do, do I need to have that level of proficiency um, and that many performances yeah. on a stage? <laughs> yeah. Um. The the big and mega church culture uh, around the world has contributed so much to the music we sing, and I'm hugely thankful for some of the great songs that have come out of the uh, the big churches around the world. I think what can be discouraging for many in a small church, and particularly a church plant situation, is um, either thinking, "Gee, we can just never do it like that," and and, and feeling completely down about it. Or uh, kind of an unfortunate, we're going to go all out to try and pursue that model of doing music. Um, what I think the kind of uh, the the modern the the conference, the big church, the YouTube uh, song culture, sh a byproduct of that is that we we focus on what happens at the front. I mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. so. It is about the cool and the beautiful people who are leading the singing. It's about having those really excellent uh, musicians, um, all eight of them spread across the stage. When I go back and look in the New Testament, uh, Colossians 3, for example, what Paul talks about um, is about letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The instrument that Paul is concerned about is the congregation, the voice it's is the the one the one thing he's concerned about and the, the congregational voice is important because that's where the word of Christ is proclaimed mm. so Paul's never concerned about how many song leaders you have whether you have a choir a pipe organ a drum kit um, uh, a cool guy playing a guitar with dark glasses mm -hmm. they're not the issues of the New Testament um, the, Paul is concerned about uh, are we encouraging the congregation to engage with Jesus in our singing? And yeah, unfortunately, there are byproducts of, of the modern music culture that kind of divert us away from that and 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 get us to think about um, the quality of the sound and the look of the people at the front. That that's one aspect of it. There's some other issues that the big churches um, uh, create, such as in a big church environment, you can you can sing songs that just sound brilliant, but you take them back to your small church and they just don't work. And there's a whole range of reasons for that. Um, uh, simply doing stuff in a big crowd just works. Yeah. Um, uh, going to a big conference where the cool guy at the front on his guitar who can sing everything half an octave higher than what you can sounds great in that, that situation and because the speakers are so big and the subwoofers are thumping hard, for some reason you are able to sing along with it and it just sounds amazing. Take it back to the 20 guys in your church and suddenly you realise, oh, no one, can, no one can actually sing this high and... Um, all those kind of uh, pop song licks that are in the tune just sound are just really awkward for everyone, and no one even wants to attempt to sing those notes. So the the big church conference kind of song can sometimes be um, uh, not appropriate for a small church, mm. and not and just discouraging when you realise it doesn't work mm. for us. Yeah, I'm not I'm not hearing you say let's not have the, the big the big conference experience or the big church experience if we can have it because it, no. you know, it is one of the it's one of the great things of coming together with a larger group and yeah you know, the, uh, the, the singing is you know is often amazing because the guys up on the stage generally you know all <laughs> can all yeah. have all trained at the con and, and can all play their musical instruments yeah. without even you know music and, and everything else. Uh, what, what about what about the unbeliever? You know what about the not yet Christian? Uh, you know you you've already mentioned that we live in a culture. You know, here in Australia, that 
you know, doesn't value singing. You know, I, yeah. I know in Wales they've got lots of men's choirs. Yeah. Um, and, and I know in England they love to sing at the football. You know, it's kind yeah. of a, a new thing in, in Australia. You know, mm. we sing our team song at, at the AFL. Mm. With, you know, we sing Happy Birthday. Yeah. There's, there's not too many. We sing the national anthem. Like all my kids are learning the national yeah. anthem. Uh, you, you know, they've all learned it in preschool. But there's not many occasions where we sing generally. How do you think about the, the not yet Christian who's, who's coming into the, to the public gathering and and, and hearing this music, seeing this music. Yeah, so I've heard actually so many different opinions on this. Um, it's hard to know what to think. So certainly you've had over the years people kind of pushing the seeker service um, model where you don't do too much music because it's weird for unbelievers to come and join in singing with a group or you focus a bit more on soloists singing from the front and it's fine to have soloists singing. It's still doing yeah. ministry of the word. Um an interesting thing in my current situation, our church is in the centre of of town, and on more than one occasion, people just walk into church because they say they've heard the singing. And I, I mean, as a muso, that's encouraging. <laughs> but um, I think there is there is something unique about Christians because we sing. I mean, we understand what we're singing about. It's about singing the word of Christ. But even to the outsider, there's something attractive about that. Um, and there's that bit in the end of uh, 1 Corinthians that talks about the unbeliever yeah. coming into church. And it's not talking about singing in particular, but it is talking about coming in and hearing the word and then falling down in worship. So um, whether the unbeliever work, walks into church and hears the gospel being preached or whether they hear the gospel being sung, I think it... Is actually an attractive thing. Yeah. They may mark us out as different, but does that does that impact you? You know, it's a nerve. Does it impact the, the does the unbeliever impact the songs that you choose or? Um... Well, it does, but um, equally for the for the <laughs> for the people that we've already got. So yeah. I I want our music to sound relevant, and it's not that we don't sing old stuff because we do we sing plenty of of old and traditional stuff, but I do it as much as I can in a contemporary style. And the old stuff's come back anyway these days. It's, it's, uh, it is. It's the, a cool cool yeah, thing to be doing. That's it. The hymns. But. <laughs> uh, now, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, sisters, systems and structures, and, and maybe that'll come up in the question time uh, yeah. know, that we have. But, but it'd be great to hear your sort of top ten things you'd encourage a church plan to be thinking through. Um, yeah. Um, so my first one is that big is never necessarily better. Um, people ask me about this all the time, and I, I know that people aim to get a big and a full band in their church. Um, in my professional opinion, um, and I have plenty of people that, that I have to call on, the more people that you have, the more things that can go wrong in music, and you generally are only as good as the worst player in the band. So a smaller team of competent people is what I would go for any day, whether it's in a big church or a small church. Now, obviously, in the small church, you're not going to have so much to draw on. And But the encouragement, I think, there is that one instrument or two instruments is actually all that you need to do great singing. Mm -hmm. So... There are some instruments, such as a piano or a guitar, that particularly do that well. If you've only got like one clarinet, that would be a harder <laughs> <laughs> instrument to lead from. Yeah. But like a harmony rhythm instrument, such as a piano guitar, on their own can do great leading of singing. Mm -hmm. Having both together is even better. But you certainly don't need a band, and bands can often actually make things worse unless they're, they're competent and actually led well. Um, but probably what's important about what I just said then is the idea of leading. Now, this applies to any size church. Uh, if people are not being led or feel that they're being led in their singing, they just won't open their mouths. Um, I, I, yeah, I can think of every, uh, situations in every kind of church that I've been in where the congregation is just not prepared to sing because no one wants to be the person to open their mouth before everyone else. Yep. If you feel confident in the person at the front, then you'll feel confident to to sing. So 
a song leader is kind of essential to good church singing. And do they have to be the best? Do they have to be you know, the best? The best singers. Like it sounds like confident. A confident singer is more important than a. Yeah, know, the, the yeah, best singer. yeah, totally. So on the one hand, the more musical they are, the better. So yeah, you do want someone with a nice voice. But the thing is, I, I have a horrible voice, but I know that I can sing in tune, so I can I can get up and lead people to sing. Yeah. Um, but I think I said before, people are not listening to um, how good my voice is. They're not um, they're not expecting me to sound like a pop pop singer. They just want me to let them know when they when they need to sing and what they need to be singing. But not you don't even have to be a musician to be a song leader. So it, it just needs to be someone who, that has the confidence to stand at the front. And for particularly in like small rural churches, it may ha be the pastor that is the song leader. Mm. If, if the pastor is the only one in that group that is actually uh, competent to stand up in front of a group of people and lead them, then that then that they will take on that that role. Yeah, often because we've you know we've had the worship wars, uh, you know here in mm. Australia we've had the you know the battle. Often the musician you know the musicians are put off to the side. Yeah. Like I, I would have thought as well, it's important they actually can see the person who's leading yeah. the music as well. Uh, yeah. How how important is that? Yeah. So good leading is is just as much visual as it is oral. Mm. Um, and it's not not the visual is not just important in terms of this is when we're going to start singing the verse. It's important in terms of um, leading people emotionally as they engage with the gospel. Everything that the song leader shows about themselves is what the congregation uh, will mirror. I remember coming to my current church, um, and uh, the the congregation leader was kind of the default song leader but what they would do is say, now we're now going to sing the next song and uh, they'd take three steps backwards look down into their service sheet and kind of completely close down and I had to say to them very quickly uh, everything that you're doing about leading the singing here is teaching the congregation mm. to shut down mm, yeah. if you're going to step back look down not engage with people that's what the rest of the congregation's going to do if we wanting people to sing the word of Christ to one another, as the New Testament tells us to do, then the song leader needs to be engaging people with their eyes. And mm. it's it can feel awkward, particularly if you haven't done it before. But looking at people and even smiling at people, which is better, um, is actually what then encourages that emotional engagement with one another and with the gospel that you're singing about. So yeah. the visual is hugely important. Even if you can't see the rest of the band, that's not so much important, but singer-song leader is. Mm -hmm. Although maybe, uh, often in small churches, the song leader may be the piano player or the guitar player. Yeah. And I've noticed, even when I have a large band and, and some singers, if the singers are doing a bad job, I can see that the congregation has got one corner of their eye looking at me. They're very astute at looking for who's in charge, because we want to follow the person that we trust. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So big's not necessarily better. A song leader is, is essential. Yeah. Number three. Yeah. Anyone, anyone within reason can lead the singing. Right. You give, you give me hope. You give me hope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna, I don't think I'm gonna be on the music roster anytime soon in my church. Um, yeah. But, but I'm gonna quote number three now. Yeah. I've got to, I've got to, Doing yeah. eight grades of piano doesn't necessarily make you the best person to stand at the front. Of a group of people, it yeah. might it might make you be the best person to accompany the congregation, but won't necessarily make you the best song leader. So it could be the pastor, it could be anyone that actually um, is able to stand at the front and engage people. Um, ideally, a musical ear is is going to help that. But doing it well, you've got you've got to do it well, and you've got to practice. Yeah, the... yeah, practice is that scary word that lay behind music of. Uh, of the last kind of 2,000 years, we don't like to do it very much, but practice is what makes stuff good. And if you've not done song leading before, then you just go home and you stand in front of the mirror and you look at yourself and you and you practice. Number four, um, I would consider a small playlist 
with songs on high rotation, by which I mean if you have a new group of people uh, that aren't used to singing together um, or may not know all the same songs as each other, the best way to feel comfortable with each other quickly is just not to sing lots of songs. Mm -hmm. Just a small, uh, small number of songs sung regularly will make people feel really comfortable. We all know the experience of, of singing an old hymn in church and suddenly the volume raises uh, fivefold simply because people just know the song. So if, if, if you're needing to establish uh, people feeling comfortable with the music quickly, get a small group of songs, uh, rotate them highly, you might get bored of them quickly and then you find some more, but it's actually a good way of, of uh, quickly uh, developing a culture where people are feeling comfortable. Uh, number five, get singing into the DNA of the church from day one. I s said this uh, earlier. Uh, it, it's so much harder if you do it on week two than if you do it on week one. Uh, it may f feel uncomfortable, but it, j if you imagine this is what I want my church to look like and I want it to be a great singing church, then don't wait till you've got the right person. You can do it playing a CD even if you've got no one to play an instrument. But get the, get the singing happening and get someone up leading it. Now, do, how, would you do that in the, you know, in the lounge room, in the core tone, core tone setup? Because often I, you know, feel you, you feel more uncomfortable in that sitting with, because you're not used to sitting, you know, in a round circle. Yeah. Uh, and often it is just a guitar and, <laughs> and a guy playing. But would you encourage him to see you in that? In that yeah, room? learn how to become comfortable doing it. <laughs> yeah, okay. And some like, like lounge room singing can sometimes be the best singing. Um, I actually haven't mentioned it here, but understanding your space and critical mass uh, really helps. Mm. So 10 people in a lounge room can make much better singing than 50 people in a, in a big room, which is too big for them. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, um, you've you mentioned that a couple of times. You know, you've talked about the, the home in Dubbo and then moving into a school hall. And, yeah. Uh, you know, so the, the whole setup of the room as well is important. As a, you know, as a music leader, you, you want to be on that as well, you know, often that's called the vibe or yeah. you know, the spaces where you want to be involved in that decision making with the, with the church plan. Yeah, I mean often you don't have control over your space but mm. when you can, um, you just want people to be close together. Well, I mean we'll know this from experience, when people are spread out it's harder for them to engage. Singing works well in a group, so if you, when you hear one another uh, you actually want to engage. Mm. Uh, with each other. Yep. Uh, you're not afraid of hearing your own voice when you're in a group. Yep. Um, and similarly, uh, as how do I say this, a smaller room as possible for the for the size. for the yeah size so. congregation is going to make the music better, the sing the singing sound better. It's the principle of singing in the shower, basically. <laughs> Anyone sounds good singing in their shower because it's a small space which echoes. <laughs> <laughs> You're the expert. Num number six. Um, try and re recruit a music person into your core group if that's the way that you're doing it. Um, as I said, the musician pastor team is the best way to ensure both the theology of the singing is right as well as the music being right. You don't want a church where you're just singing the, the pastor's favourite Sunday school songs from 50 years ago, neither do you want the church where the muso is trying to uh, just copy everything off YouTube. You want balance of good theology and and musical expertise. Now, how do you encourage, I mean, how do you encourage the, the music person, you know, like how, or how, how would you want the church planter or the church leader to encourage you as a, as a, as a you know, the music leader in your core, in your core team? You're going to have to spend time meeting and actually then and working through uh, a bit of theology about singing and worship. Mm. Uh, unless, uh, I mean this is really important for our church musicians, is why the Amy is so big on training church musicians, is that you'll never actually get it right unless you understand the what the ministry is that you're involved with. Unless you understand that being the ministry of the Word of Christ and the Holy Spirit, then all you're going to be going and doing each week is putting on a performance, which is not what church music's about. Yep. So sorting out that theology for both past and music, muso is essential. G giving them a budget, like I'm, some of the things I'm thinking, at least having a budget line for, for buying music ministry resources, you know, give, giving them... The yeah, there's normally no budget at yeah, all. Yeah, giving them the latest, <laughs> latest Christian CD as well, you know, to say, hey, really love how you're encouraging us 
each week. Yeah. You know, here's a, here's a here's a CD to keep on high rotation in your car. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's go to go to conferences. Listen, go to conferences. Listen to what the new songs are. Um, CCLI gives you lists of of what Jesus. are the uh, what are the latest songs. Do some hard work and say, will that song work for our church? Right, number seven. Um, the congregation, because of the singing, and you need to hard about that. More and more, as I said, we're thinking that music is about what goes on at the front, whereas the Bible is saying singing is about what happens in the congregation. So it's a hard balance to get right. We want to encourage excellence in our playing and our song leading, but only for the sake of encouraging that congregational voice, the congregation engaging with Jesus and his word. Um, which probably takes me on to point eight. Think about the theology of, of what singing is. And Colossians 3.16 is probably one of the clearest verses in the New Testament that explains it. Um, if anything, it, 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 Colossians 3.16 uh, uh, gives us a kind of triangle of how the word, word of Christ works in a church, that God ministers that word to his people. Um, uh, we are involved with that ministry as we um, sing the word of Christ to one another and the word of Christ inspires and, and fills the contents of our praise and prayer and our thanksgiving, which is basically what the church is. It, it, it's the ministry of Christ to us and, and our using it of God's gifts as we serve one another and, and respond with prayer and praise and thanksgiving. So music, uh, getting, the, getting the music right uh, kind of reflects getting the rest of church right in many ways. Now, we're coming up to your final two. It's yeah. a great time if you've got questions to send those questions through. So uh, tell us the last two things you'd encourage a church planner to be thinking about in terms of music. Yeah, uh, a, a big thing that people are grappling with, I find in a lot of places, is uh, emotion and the place of the heart. Mm. And I want to be really clear that the Bible is all about the gospel engaging our heart. Mm. Like... Uh, uh, Paul, in so many different places, is talking about uh, the, the joy and, and the thanksgiving that the gospel inspires in us. And music is, I think, is given as the example of, of, of engaging our emotions with, with the word, with the gospel. Um, so as you're setting, a, as you're setting up uh, a music ministry, this needs to be one of the key points. Uh, do you want your church to be a church where the heart is engaged by the gospel? And how are you going to let the music do that well and avoid the dangers of um, just trying to pursue uh, emotion? Because the music is a great vehicle to, to, uh, to whip people up. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, we, we, we want there to be emotion there. We want hearts to be engaged, but we want the gospel to, to generate that. Emotion within us. Yeah, great. And you need to stay on that all the time. My last one is don't pursue cool. I've kind of, kind of already said this earlier. Um, my bet is that if you try and pursue cool, you'll fail in any case <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, you're not playing playing a professional uh, backing band with um, highly trained singers uh, to do the job for you. So um, people in a, in a church want authenticity and they want to be uh, led by people that they can see love Jesus and love them. They don't want the concert band at the front. So, yeah, you'll fail if you try and pursue cool. Right, well, that's an excellent, that's an excellent list to, uh, to sort of, I guess, think into music with, uh, with a core team. Um, I want to hear from our, our audience. So yeah. our first question comes from Rebecca. Uh, she she asks, have you got any suggestions, Philip, on where uh, music should fit in the service? For example, at the start or in response to the sermon, uh, what do you think works best? Okay, both those places are where I want <laughs> music. Um, I mean, you could talk for hours about what liturgy is is good for church and 
I've got to say that when I look at in the New Testament, it doesn't actually tell me very much at all about what the ideal is. Um, however, there have been great models over the years about um, um, uh, using music to cover a whole lot of different bases, the, the praise, the adoration, the confession, prayer. Um, I think music works great throughout a service as we integrate uh, the word being preached with the word being sung together. I know a lot of churches tend to have a kind of a word and a worship divide, so like half an hour of singing and then half an hour of preaching, and they're not connected. I I I don't love that for many reasons, but but uh, the main reason I I love music working throughout the service is that you you can use the the, su the sung word for prayer and praise. And confession, but the uh, I think in the question there, uh, in response to the sermon, is actually a crucial thing. Uh, we're never good at um, responding to what we've heard in a talk. I know we would love people to walk out of church and be be talking about the sermon for the next half an hour over coffee and tea. But, uh, that often doesn't happen. Mm. If you get the song right after the sermon. Um, you're, you're helping the congregation to engage with what they've heard. Um, the song doesn't necessarily need to just be saying all the exact same points as what's just mm. been preached, but it needs to be a response song, hopefully connected in some way. We, we want people to engage, we want people to respond to what they hear preached every week. We want them to do that in the whole of their lives, but that song is almost the first step in them doing that. Yep. Yep. Um, I've kind of heard it said before that people don't go out, go out of church humming the sermon, but humming the songs. Um, if you can get that, get the songs, and particularly that responsive song to the sermon, uh, right, then you're actually giving people a hook to take out of church with them and and take that word. Uh, in, for the rest of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. We've got a, we've got another question coming from uh, from Miles. What about recorded music? So you mentioned that you know that. Could be what you use in a mm. in a church that has no musicians. Is is that effective? It's nobody's ideal, but um, look, there, there are no ideals mm. in, in many of our churches. So I've helped some people I know in the UK uh, start a church up over the last year, um, and my way of helping them was I was jumping on their piano every week and recording uh, a couple of songs for them. To sing along to. Now, certainly, you can go out and buy, um, uh, yeah, music. yeah. But you know, sometimes even just uh, the normal uh, recorded CD with someone singing on it is 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 good because you've actually got a voice on it, and people want to be led by a voice actually more more than they want music. My whole thing with using recorded music is you still want a song leader, so. Uh, a CD can't replace a person engaging with you. Yep. So if you're using recorded music, that's fine to still get someone up whose responsibility it is to engage the group. Great. Yeah. Well, I, I can remember we had an 8 a.m. service where we used to have a whole bunch of tracks of, uh, of organ, you know, organ music. And, yeah. And and you know the congregation loved it. Mm. Loved it. Yeah. Even a cappella is is great if you got someone happy to yeah, to yeah, lead it. To yeah. uh, okay. Got another question from uh, Steve. Is it better to delay launching than pull the trigger without quality and or organisation? Gee, that's a bigger question than just music. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess, I guess yeah. behind that question as well is, is should, you know, should music, should music be driving, you know, driving that question and the ability to be able to put on, you know, a good level of music. The, the other question I think behind that as well is, um, is the you know. The size, the size of the church plan as well. You know, it's, yeah. I know, I know there are some denominational networks uh, here in Australia who won't launch until seventy, you know, to seventy-five. Yeah. Um, yeah. The reason for that is because they've got, you know, they've got the eight musicians on the stage. So mm. it, it, it looks silly. You know, it, it's not not appropriate to have eight musicians on the stage when you've only got ten people in the congregation. Look, my <laughs> my fondest memories of of church singing. Um, are still sitting with uh, 15 people in a lounge room in Dubbo. Yeah. The, the singing is, is in much bigger situations has never matched that for me. Um, so it's not about the size whatsoever. 
I think um, it's not it's not about having a band in place to get going. I do think it is important though to have thought: Do we have someone who's able to get up and lead this? Yeah. Uh, whether that causes you to delay or not, um, um, I think if you want music to be in the DNA, though, you work out a way to make it work. Yeah. So, as I said, these guys that I helped um, last year, they they wanted the singing to be good from day one. Um, uh, they were happy to work from the recorded music, and I pushed them hard on making sure someone was prepared to, to lead them. And they hadn't thought about that, but they said, yes, we, we will do it. And uh, you'd be surprised. Every, every group has people that can, can take on that role. Mm. Yeah, good, excellent. So work out a way. Your, but again, your personality is, is working out the <laughs> solution to the problem. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but that's all for here. Um, Peter asks, how large a rotation of songs would you have going at any one particular time? Okay, no easy answer to that question. Uh, it kind of depends, A, on the size of the group and their, um, their competence. Um, however, we do, uh, uh, so at our church in Oxford, um, we do have small um, new plant planted church and our list I think is about 20 songs when we started and we're we're growing it so uh, 20 songs I think is enough to um, have some variety in it so you're not singing everything every week but the thing, there's nothing wrong with singing one song every week if I teach a new song to any congregation I would do it a couple of weeks in a row so um, often it's musicians that get, get bored with songs quicker than what congregations do because they're going over them all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, congregations actually have a quite high tolerance for singing so songs a, regularly. So a list of 20, 20 songs yeah. is, is a helpful place to start. Yeah, um, and but, so you, but grow it. But grow it, yeah. And yeah, so as you're growing that list as well, you're obviously um, culling as well. You, you're getting yeah. songs that... Uh, yeah, for whatever reason, you Yeah, and the thing is, every church will like different stuff and have the ability to sing different stuff. So, you, I mean, we're all clever enough to figure out this song just doesn't work yeah. for this church. So just give, yeah. give it a chance and then ditch it. I have seen some, you know, some larger churches are actually putting online their, you know, their Spotify list of songs. Yeah. Their, their list of rotations, which I think is a great, you know, it's a great resource for the smaller church to, you know, where, which, which has the larger music director is obviously thinking about more than you know, someone who's yeah, but why, why not get the church to learn the songs before they come? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good call. Well, I mean, back in the day, people used to do that. They used to walk up an hour before church and yeah. have singing practice before yeah. they <laughs> before they got ready for church. Um, I guess along these lines, Pedro asked the question: What's the best setup for thirty to fifty people? Say in terms of people up front, instruments. You know, do you have some you know sort of thinking into that? Often that's the you know the the ideal yeah. you know, size. See, I would love a piano and a guitar for that that size. Um, I mean, I have no problem just leading 30 people on a piano, but a piano and a guitar gives you um, a whole lot of different uh, resources in terms of melody and, and texture and, and rhythm. So those two instruments are excellent. But, I mean, often you have random instruments. So you might have a girl that plays the flute or, or a clarinet or a bassoon or or anything and the thing is you can use any of those instruments to help uh, help bring color to the music but you ideally want like a piano guitar or even an organ that d can just do the hard job of supporting the group but uh, how many, how many uh, singers? Uh, uh, singer? yeah, yeah. Uh, one singer is essential <laughs> yeah um, uh, two is better but if I get two my ideal is a male and a female um, just because we all will relate a little bit better to the person that sings like what what we do. Yeah. So there's no there's there's very little point putting five girl singers at the front of church. It won't uh, help things in any way. May as well just they may as well be in the congregation uh, because it's not about boosting things at the front. It's about boosting the congregational yeah. singing. What about the importance of having a bloke up front singing? Uh, uh, 
ideal if you've got someone that can can do it. I mean, I can't even get uh, in a larger church. I can't even get blokes mm. for a lot of my services. But it, it's it's my ideal scenario to always have a have a guy and a girl. Yeah, good, good. Well, we've got a few more questions, so so keep them coming through. Uh, Charles asked this question as an observation of the way things work in the world. It's often the case that non-believing guests are turned off. Uh, from church because of the awkward or low quality music. He's pursuing high quality and great sounding music according to the context uh, for this reason a biblical and helpful pursuit. Yes. So we, the Bible, you know, Jesus commands us, go and make disciples. Um, I don't think I ever, I don't want to ever do music that sounds awkward. Mm. <laughs> but I, and I certainly want to pursue excellence in the people playing and accompanying. So it's the whole reason that I run conferences is to help people to do that well. But I don't think that's the ultimate thing that is attractive to others. I, what is attractive is a is a loving community which is engaged with the gospel that they're singing about. A, a group of people that are singing the gospel with passion is 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 the, the far more attractive thing than the, the excellent band. There's plenty of churches that have an excellent band and people don't sing um, because they're just not, their, their gospel priorities are wrong in their singing. So yes, excellence when, um, is definitely worth pursuing, but pursue the excellence of the congregation engaging with the gospel first. Get the focus right yeah. on, on seeing the church sing yeah. uh, and not having it necessarily the best. Uh, okay, we've got uh, one final question. Mark asks, do you have a, a go-to place for new music? Obviously, emu's a shoe. <laughs> um, just your plug, emu, emu, uh, .com .au, is emumusic.com is all you need to go to. Um, <laughs> certainly, I would push emu, and I uh, certainly recommend the whole uh, range of other people as well. What I would say, though, that is uh, that emu... Uh, Sovereign Grace, Stuart Town, and the Gettys. Uh, they're all they all write a range of music, and some of it will be appropriate for your church, and some of it won't. So I know that we will write, Amy will write some songs that are too hard for churches that don't have a a competent band, mm. and yet we also try and write songs that work in any context. And kind of the Stuart Town and Keith Getty songs kind of fall more down that end. They're just really straightforward, not much to think about kind of songs and they're always great for for small and small churches and people or churches that are getting used to each other and learning how to sing yeah. uh, hymns again are good there's nothing to think about in terms of the rhythm and it just makes people sing and engage much faster much faster so pulling out the old hymn book is you know you've always got a, a hymn book on the guard yeah reflecting on old Wesleyan songs and uh, yeah you don't have to play them old and stodgy. <laughs> play them with 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 life and energy, but choose the songs that your church can sing. Okay, we've got uh, we've got one last uh, one last question. Nathan asks, how do you continue to motivate and inspire people to pursue excellence in leading music amidst the pressures of church planning when there's just so much to do? Um. Just clarify for that me for me. So the, is this the church planter's yes. got so much to do? Yeah, the church planter, and also, you, you know, you as a church planter, obviously, you want your your music team also to be, uh, you know, active in evangelism. Yeah. Your music team also be um, involved in being hospitable and yeah. you know, having people around. You want to, you know, well, the, running the running the simple Christianity course as well. Well, in in my current larger church, I don't want people in my music team unless they are doing those other things. So I don't want people that music is their only focus in church. I don't want them unless they're they're part of a small group and and doing some other kind of ministry. I want ministry-minded people mm. leading music, and often that means that they're the more busy people in the church. Um, on from the side of the church planter, uh, my simple answer is uh, you're never going to compromise on your preaching of the word. So I'm similarly not going to compromise on the, the singing of the word. Mm. The preaching and the singing of the word in most churches are the two main uh, elements of the, the public gathering. So um, we don't compromise on either. I've often seen um, 
you know, you, there's a lot of our, a lot of our chess trainers are actually very capable musicians, mm. uh, and I'm sure you know they want to they want to jump in and actually lead the music and yeah. uh, be an active member. But I, I want to keep encouraged and uh, find you know find the, the people in the church who can do that rather than you know yeah. take it on yourself. Yeah, certainly I've had to like preach a sermon and play the songs, <laughs> do everything else. It's not ideal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, find find other people. Uh, and and I, I mean I can't say it for, for every situation. Sometimes there just are, are uh, no one that can help. But that's that's pretty rare actually in in today's world. Well, Phil, it's been uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you this morning. Uh, it's been great. You know, you've shared shared so much of your experience, um, and it's great to see your passion to see the church uh, singing the praises of God um, and encouraging each other in that. So mm. really, uh, it was a great pleasure to have you here with us this morning. Thanks. And I'd like to thank everybody for actually taking part in the webinar today. We've had a, a jam-packed room of people all over Australia listening to Phil and Scott as he's quizzed him about various aspects of establishing a music ministry in your church plant. Uh, we hope you've benefited from today's planter session. And before we sign off, we'd like to point you to our next webinar, which is coming up on, uh, at, well, actually not far away at all. It's coming up on the 5th of August, and that's the A to Z of assessment. Now, Mikey Lynch, a director of Geneva Push, is actually chatting with Scott Sanders, whose primary job is to lead people through that maze of assessment, which will set them up well for a good church plant. And also Greg Lee will be in on the conversation. He's the pastor at Hunter Bible Church, all about the assessment process and what potential planters and planting couples should expect and how, in fact, they can actually do well at that process, not just for the sake of getting some imaginary mark, but more so they can prepare themselves for the hard yards ahead. We also have a range of traditional network events and conferences coming up, so you should check out our event calendar on the Geneva Push website. Don't miss out. There's plenty to get involved with as we grow together uh, in our goal of planning more churches for God. <laughs>